Welcome to The Heart Chamber. I am your host, Boots Knighton. I interview Jason Crutchley. He is a heart and liver transplant survivor and thriver. His story is incredible. He was born with a congenital heart defect and underwent a surgery when he was younger. But by the time he was in his mid-40s, it was time to change out the engine. He and I go long in this episode, and every bit of it is important. So I hope you'll take a listen. And I want to hear from you. You can go to my website, theheartchamberpodcast.com, and fill out the contact form or leave me a voicemail. If you have a story you want to share on The Heart Chamber, I know that it will have an impact on so many. I'm also accepting donations on my website as podcasts are not cheap to produce. I appreciate you listening, so let's get to it. I'm so, so, so happy to be connecting today, and I I just am blown away, and I'm so happy that we found each other through Anna Jaworski, yeah. who has the heart heart to heart podcast with Anna and it's such a great podcast and she connected us and I interviewed her in episode 14 and that was such an important interview where she shares the story about her son being born with a congenital heart defect so listeners be sure to go back and listen to that it's such an important story on how to advocate for the ones you love and so today, now I'm interviewing, you know, Jen, you, Jen, and Jason as a couple, and you guys went through an epic, epic event where Jason had a heart and liver transplant. So let's just like dive into yeah. that. Where do you want to start? Well, I mean, obviously it, it all starts from the very beginning, right? So um, I was born in 76 with four congenital heart defects. All four of them are very common to find in males. Uh, they are atrial septal defect, transposition, transposition of the great vessels, subaortic stenosis, and pulmonary atresia. So basically, in layman's terms, I was born with one chamber of my heart instead of four. At six weeks old, I had a pulmonary bandy. And they said, eh, I mean, initially, the doctors told my mom, look, he's not going to live past a year. And so, of course, I made it to uh, six and slowly started suffocating to death. It was so slow that uh, you don't, it's, it's not something that you notice every day, but if you look back on a time span, you go, oh yeah, that's, it's definitely happening. And so at age six, I underwent the classic Fontan uh, procedure at UCLA. I was the first child to have it done at UCLA. I brought Dr. Lax over from South America and he's been there pretty much ever since. And so at age six, they utilized my case as a study case. So I'm happy enough to say that at age six, I trained surgeons. So that's kind of a, a cool thing. <laughs> I mean, one for the record books, right? Yes. Yeah, so what did you do at six years old? Oh, I was training heart surgeons. What? Okay. Yeah, pretty cool. So, um, so I did that and it was successful, obviously. And it, it went fairly well up until... Oh gosh, I was probably about 11 when I started 10. Yeah, about 10 years old when I started experiencing supraventricular tachycardias or SVTs. And so my heart rate would go from, you know, an average of 60 beats a minute all the way up to 200, 250 beats a minute. And the doctors tried multiple times to do everything you can think of from blowing on your thumb to ice water, you know, shoving my face in ice water to try to get my heart to convert back to normal sinus rhythm. None of that happened. So they finally had to pull out the paddles and cardiovert. So I had that done probably about, I don't know, 15, 20 times in my life. And it's, uh, it's, it's a scary experience, especially as a child, you know, it's, it's definitely, you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as it is, I mean, you're already scared because of you're in the hospital medicines. And this is mind you during a time where hospitals have changed so much so much like since I was a kid like and maybe it's because I've grown up into an adult obviously but I remember as a kid like the doctors never talked to me right they always talked to my mom they never like included me I mean other than hey there kiddo how you doing kind of thing but it it's now it seems to me like there's so much more compassion 
uh, within the medical community for the kids. And they, they try to allow these kids to really be a part of their, their medical process, which I think is, is extremely important for a number of reasons. You know, first of all, it, I think if, if you're willing, and when I say you, meaning of course, children, if they're willing, it makes it easier to understand what's going on with yourself. Right. And allowing yourself to have that knowledge and being able to advocate for yourself is crucial. It's so crucial. And so there's that aspect of it. And then also, of course, just the fact that like growing as you get older, you're able to go, oh, yes, I was a, a key part in my care. And, it, you know, I never felt like I was outcasted because the doctors wanted to talk to only my parents and not to me. So back then, of course, when I went through all the, the super ventric, ventricular tachycardias, it was always, oh, let's talk to your mom about this, not let's listen to me and let me tell you what's going on. I remember distinctively many times going into the ER with SVT and telling the doctors, here's what you need to do. You need to put me under, give me 20 cc's of her set, knock me out and pull out the card, you know, paddles and cardio over me. Oh, no, 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 no. We, we don't want to do that. You know, we, we want to do all these other options. And I'm like, you're, you're wasting your time. You're making me upset and I'm in a lot of pain. So let's end this right away. So, um, yeah. you know, we, we got through that and, um, at, I mean, I, I made it all. Well, let's stop right there. I have questions. Yeah. I have questions. Yeah. I am like, and, uh, I'm in an uproar for you because I, right, here you are trying to be your own best advocate. And thank goodness we have evolved as a species like, since then on how to right. treat each other. But, you know, I'm just picturing you as a kid and you've already been through so much. And as you're dealing with all this, were you a normal kid? Did you, I mean, I, were you able yeah, to play yeah. sports? So, like set the no, stage that's, for I mean, us. That is a great, great question because um, it's funny. So I was raised by a single mom and my grandmother. And I say my grandmother in the sense that like I would visit my grandmother every summer. Right. And of course, we lived about two hours away from my grandmother. So we would go visit her. It wasn't all the time. But I do recall in the summers I would go and visit, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks, you know, on end with her. And my mom, she raised me as a healthy child. She was completely like, go out, go run and play. I want you doing everything a normal kid would go out and do. You want to go play football? Go ahead. You're going to fall on your face. And when you do, I will be there, right? My mom was super supportive of that, which really I think is a, a better way to parent your children that have CHDs. Um, and I've talked to many uh, CHD families and, I, and, and this is kind of one of the big things I really promote with them is, look, your kids, they're going to know their limits. Like they'll, they'll know them, right? Whether you want them to or not, they know what their, their limits are and they won't go past that. I mean, they will to a point simply because of nature, right? Like I was always pushing the envelope of probably doing a lot of things I really shouldn't have been doing. But that's where I had to learn my limits, right? It's if you don't push that envelope, you don't know how far you can really go. My grandmother was just the opposite. She wanted me in a bubble, wouldn't let me do simple things like riding a bike. She wouldn't let me go out and ride a bike. She, anytime I went to go visit, it was, you know, oh, here, let's sit down on the carpet and color like all day. Like, really? God, my brother's outside. He's playing. I want to go outside and play too. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, he's going to go swimming and mm -hmm. I want to go swim too. Oh, oh, okay. But you have to be really close to your brother. Like she would let us go swimming, but literally, um, and, and I don't even know like what was told to my brother. I'm sure she probably told him, Hey, you know, you really got to watch over him and you know, you've got to be the big brother. And like, she would not allow me to leave his side. I, I constantly had to be with him. Whereas my mom was like, Hey, you want to go swim in the lake? Go for it. Bye. And, you know, she was so supportive of anything that I wanted to go do. And, and it just, I don't know. I think it was just a better way to live. I think any child, whether you're healthy or not, that's the way to live. You know, go and be you, be what you're supposed to be, a kid, right? Having fun. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we actually, my brother and I did uh, basketball together at, in school. We, we were part of the team. I wasn't very good, mind you, but, but I was still part of the team. 
<laughs> um, football was never like that was never really my thing. I, I would do like the the little pickup games that you do with all your buddies and stuff. But that was about the extent of it. Never really was into into baseball. I mean, I like the idea of it. And, and even now, I, and I, I think a lot of it is just because I was raised by a single mom. It's like we didn't we didn't do sports. You know, none of us did. So even now, right. I don't even watch sports. I'm not a and sports person. And where, what town did you grow up in? You mentioned you had your surgery at yeah, UCLA. Yeah, so I grew up um, in a very small town called Los Alamos. It's in California. It's about an hour, about an hour north of Santa Barbara for for people that, that are aware of it. So, and then like nine miles mm -hmm. north of Los Alamos is Santa Maria area. And so I kind of grew up in, in those two towns all the way up through uh, until my beginning of high school. And then beginning of high school, I moved up to Sacramento and pretty much lived there majority of my life. I, I had a, a little bit of extended time in South Lake Tahoe until, ironically, the altitude caught up to me because of my heart condition. So those that aren't aware, when you generally have heart conditions, you can't be in, in high altitude places. It, it makes it very challenging to breathe and you're already having issues trying to breathe anyways. So, yeah, and, and of course, I was, you know, I was 18, 19 years old when I moved to South Lake Tahoe. And at 19 years old, you know everything. So, you know what? I'm going to go there. And again, my mom, very supportive. Go ahead. When you fall on your face, I'll be right back here. And I did. Six, yeah, I think I was there for, yeah, like six months. I don't even think I was there for a full six months. I think it was like four months, kind of think of it. And it just, I couldn't breathe. And I'm like, I've got to come home. And so that's, that's what I did. Came back down to Sacramento. So yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting how I don't know if it's that my mom had that foresight or if maybe the doctors told her, hey, let him just try and live the best life that he can because he's not going to be around for very long. I, I don't know. I mean, this is again, it's during a time when we didn't have internet. So it's not like my mom had access to look up information like they do now. There was no support group. I mean, I didn't know my first heart friend until I was 40 years old. And how old are you now? Yeah, I am now 46, 46, 47. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's been, uh, you know, for my mom, it was extremely challenging raising a heart child, specifically one that had so many issues that were extremely rare. All, all four of my conditions were very, very rare to find together. Individually, each condition is very common to find amongst males, which I found was ironic. There's been no huh. history of heart conditions in my family. So I am literally a fluke. The gift that so, yeah, I'm special. Yeah. Well, I'm the gift that God gave me. It's, on, it's an honor to know you. Thank you. <laughs> like, seriously, it is an Thank honor you. to know you. And just to add in something, um, and I was speaking with another heart friend a few days ago, and she, Instead of using the word congenital heart defect, she uses the term congenital heart difference. Oh, I like that. And that really hit wow. me because yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm making up that you, it seems like you have really worked through like some of the emotional pieces of this. And I definitely want to touch on that more later, but I know at least for me, when I learned about all the, the special parts of, of my heart. I really got stuck on I'm defective for a while. And I just really appreciate how you just framed all that. And it, it's not an easy emotional mental road. Like it's heart stuff. It's all three physical, emotional, Absolutely. mental. Yeah. Right. And I think that's true for any any physical right. challenge. But with the heart that keeps you yeah. alive. It just is like next level. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, I just appreciate your your lightheartedness. Yeah, of it. no, I mean that's I, I like I got I have chills and Jen Jen probably laughing at me. I have chills right now because I never even thought of it that way as congenital heart differences. Certainly, it's absolutely correct, and I I love that analogy. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> store that in my memory because that that's definitely what I was. I was a difference. The doctors can't explain it. Even to this day, the doctors still have no idea why I got the differences that I did in my heart. And, and I should, let me go back just a moment to when I was six and I had that, that surgery, the classic Fontan. At that time, my mother was given two options. One option was the, the Fontan, which again, had never been done on a child at UCLA. And there was a 2% chance that I would make it through. 
The other option was a heart transplant, which had never been done on a child at all, anywhere in the world. That was going to give me 1% chance of living. So of course, my mom played the numbers game and said, yep, let's go with the classic Fontan, right? I'm sure I, I have no proof, um, and we'll get into this in a bit. I, I don't know what exactly was told to my mom about that surgery, but I suspect there were some things that were told to her about the possible side effects from that surgery that my mom just kind of went, yeah, I don't care. Just keep them living, you know? We got to do right, something. Exactly. And, we have and, to and try something, so, right? right? Like as yeah. a parent, I would be the same way. No, just, mm -hmm. you know, heal my child. And so... Like I said, the, the procedure went great. I did very, very well. I, the doctors and nurses, everybody were just really amazed at how well I did with it. And, and in fact, one of the side effects from that surgery was the supraventricular tachycardia. So, which obviously I did get, and, and we dealt with that. And, um, you know, it was okay. They, they finally figured out that they could put me on a regimen of medications that would prevent a lot of it. They had to go in and do some minor procedures as far as like um, get rid of some of the scar tissue that would help with a lot of the SVTs. And it, and it did. And so I made it all the way to 21. And at age 21, they decided that it was time to do a, basically a recondition of that, that surgery. So it was called a lateral tunnel conversion Fontan. And what it was, I was starting to develop symptoms of just exhaustion, feeling tired, worn out, you know, and, and there was really no explanation behind it. I'm a pretty fit guy for the most part. I, I enjoy the outdoors. Um, I love hiking. I love biking. I'm real. I was at that, that time I was really, really into water skiing, wakeboarding, you know, kneeboarding, like anything on the water. That's my jam. Like, and, and even to this day, I love being out on the water, whether it's on a boat or in kayaks or what have you. And so I've always been very fit in that. I've always had a very high metabolism. So constantly go, 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 go. And it, like I said, when, when you just start losing that, that steam and you know, I mean, you're the same way you're doing a lot of hiking and biking. And, and I, I know from hearing your story where you just started losing that, that energy and you're like, there's no explanation behind this. I don't get it. And so, um, that's what happened to me. Same thing. And they, they just, they looked into it and they went, yeah. Your Fontan is starting to not function as well as it should. So we have this, this procedure that we can do lateral tunnel conversion Fontan that will give you back, you know, your, your quality of life. And I'm okay, great. Now, of course, at this time, 21, now they're starting to talk to me more. Right. And, and of course I kept my mom in the loop. My mom has always been like right there, my right hand person. I have a very, 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 very close relationship with my mom. We, We've traveled the United States full times. We've driven, uh, in doing that, driven from California to Maine four different times. We've driven from California to Florida. So she's always been like my travel buddy. We've gone to Italy together, uh, Mexico together. So yeah, she's just, she's always, and of course, because she's my mom and always, you know, looking out for me and my best interest, just caring for me. Like she was my rock, you know, she was a hardworking woman, single mom. She worked road construction for 12 years. She did oil fields prior to that. And this was all during a time when women did not do those jobs. So she was a pioneer in herself, right? Yeah. Doing, you know, road construction. Yes, she I mean, was. Yeah. Yeah. She was, she was always on like heavy equipment. And I mean, yeah. So it's wow. funny because my mom's like. What a badass. Yeah. She was hardcore. She, <laughs> she would always tell us, yes, look, I work six <laughs> days a week. And on my one day off, I don't want to spend the day cleaning the house or, you know, cooking or this or that. She goes, I want to spend it with you kids going and doing something fun. So it's your job to, you know, keep the house clean and, you know, wash the dogs and mow the lawn and, you know, do all this stuff. So again, she didn't hold me back. Jason, you're still going to get out there and mow the lawn. I don't care if it's hard for you, you know? So it was good. And so my mom has always really been my rock behind all this very much, you know, the relationship that you had with your mom, which I think was, was super awesome. When I heard your story, it was like, wow, we have so many similarities. It's pretty wild. And so naturally when I was 21, went through the surgery, of course, I kept her in the loop as to what was going on. She came down, you know, she always made sure to be right there by my side. And so that surgery actually went very, very well. I had no issues after 21, done, was doing great, working in radio at the time, 
did just about anything you could think of. I was, for all intents and purposes, I was a healthy person with a scar down the middle of my chest. And, you know, it never bothered me. As a child, I remember that that scar bothered me a bit. You know, I, I would hate to go swimming because the kids would laugh at me or I'd have purple lips and they would laugh at me. And, you know, I would get teased a lot as a child. But I never like, I've, I've heard of other people that, that really got like seriously teased and tormented. I didn't. And I, I don't know if it's because I grew up in a small town where everybody knew everybody. And because of that, everybody looked out for everybody. You know, it's like, yeah, they tease me about it. But at the same time, you know, when I went into SBT as a kid, all the school kids, and this happened in, cl in class, all the kids gathered around me and they were very, very supportive and, you know, wanted to do everything that they could. They'd stop by the house and, you know, what can we do for them yet? And these were the same kids that were teasing me as a kid. So again, I don't know if it's because I grew up in a small town. So I was able to really not let it affect me. You know, it was like, oh, okay. So this is how life is going to be. I'm going to get teased because I have purple lips or because I have a scar down my chest or, but whatever, it's my life. And that's how I took it all my life. It was just like, okay, this is who I am, whether you like me or not. I think maybe my personality made up for it. And maybe that's why I have the personality that I do, which is, if you can't tell, very outgoing, very optimistic, you know, here we go. So it, it, it definitely made a big difference in, I think in everything. And, and I'll get into that more as we get further here. So 21, go through the uh, lateral tunnel conversion Fontan, had no problems, did excellent. Wasn't until 2017, I was driving limousines at the time. At that point, I'd been driving limousines for about 25 years, specialized in wine tours in the Napa region. And I was very, very good at what I did. Very good. I was the, the top chauffeur in the Sacramento region. I had other companies that were calling me, wanting me to either come work for them or come and train their guys. And I had clients. Did oh, you get to meet a lot of famous people? Yeah. I mean, I did. I, I had my share of stars, quite frankly. And I, I mean, <laughs> if there's other chauffeurs out there, please. I mean, me, but famous. Yeah, no, uh, there's, uh, <laughs> there's never like, I'm not a big star fan. I'm not a starstruck person. I've actually only been starstruck twice in my life. One of them was when I got a chance to go and see Air Supply in concert. And then I went backstage to meet greet with them. Uh, and that was simply because my mom, when we drove those two hours ago, visit my grandmother as kids, my mom would always play Air Supply in the car and we would fall asleep and take naps in the car to Air Supply. And I told these guys that story and they're like, great. So we put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> It, it was great. But yeah, so that's the first time I was ever starstruck. And then the second time uh, was when I met Eric Estrada from Chips. And again, you know, an 80s child grew up watching Chips, loved Chips. That was, all right, I want to be a police officer because of Chips. That, you know, there it was. So here I am getting a chance to meet, you know, one of my my childhood idols. But that was it. Uh, and and I'd met like some of my my favorite artists in the world. Um, I've chauffeured them around. I've had vice presidents. I've had secret service. I've had, you know, lots of big stars, big, big stars. And it's just, I don't know. I'm not, I was never, I would much prefer to have the blue collar worker as my clientele than a star simply because to me, I feel that they appreciated it so much more. You know, the, especially the ones that like, okay, everyone's scraped up your money. Let's get a limo, you know? Like those are the people that really, really enjoyed it. But as a wine tour specialist, I got to go visit some of the most amazing wineries in Napa, right? These are like world renowned wineries and uh, got, got to know a lot of the winemakers and the owners and, you know, have 70, 80, $90 bottles of wine given to me. And so, yeah, I had to do a lot of homework, a lot of wine tasting, but uh it, it was it was fantastic. I, I loved the career. But in 2017, again, started to have problems not being able to breathe. But let me back up just a moment. During the year of 2016, my mom uh, was in and out of hospitals, hospice, home. And for the for the better part of 2016, actually, really more that the last half of 2016 to so start. Yeah, starting about June of 2016. And I was 
months. Again, working full time, coming home, taking care of my home, and then going over to my mom's and taking care of her and her house and everything that she needed to get done. And then I would get home at you know midnight and up again at four or five o'clock the next morning. And so I did this for the better part of six months and I was, I was just exhausted. I, I was really getting exhausted. So in January of 2017, my mom was back in the hospital and the doctors had come in. My grandmother was visiting. I don't remember. We were just having so many problems that, that I know um, I called my grandmother up. She actually drove up with her best friend and a family member. I mean, truly, Sally has been a very close. She's known me since I was. In fact, I have a stuffed animal that Sally gave me for my surgery when I was six years old. So that, like, that's how close of a friend she is. And so, so Sally, my grandmother that's came incredible. up. Yeah. And, and we, we went to go visit my, my mom in the hospital and the doctor came in and said, so, you know, was asking her basic questions and then kind of turned to us and says, yeah, so, you know, she's an end stage cirrhosis and none of us had heard that. None of us really knew what was going on with my mom. She never, my mother was the very, very quiet in, in the respects that, yeah, she would fight for her rights. She would fight for, for me, but she would never tell me or let on that she was sick. Or that she had problems or, you know, she was like, I guess it's because she, she didn't want to take any of that focus off of me. I don't know. And maybe to her, my problems were greater than hers. I, who knows? So the doctors, uh, again, told us, yes, she has end stage cirrhosis. She has COPD. And I'm like, okay, well, like, what do you mean end stage cirrhosis? Like, are, what are we talking here? And they, she goes, yeah, she doesn't have much longer. I said, well, can you give me a, a rough time? And, and of course, that's always a hard question, I think, to ask doctors is, is, well, how much longer do I have or does this person have, right? Because no doctor in their right mind is going to want to say, well, your, your person, has, you know, whoever has six months to live, a month to live, whatever. And I, I don't know that, that the doctor actually gave me an answer to that, which is fine. Like, I'm, I'm totally okay with that. So doctor left, my grandmother Sally and myself, we went, we went downstairs. My mom was looking tired. So we went downstairs to the cafeteria and I had excused myself. I said, Hey, I'll, I'll be right back. Went up to talk to my mom. And, um, because I think that was like, that was the first time that my mom heard that I heard, you know, what was going on. And so I asked her, I said, Hey, you know, how do you feel about this? And she says, um, she goes, I'm okay. She goes, I'm, I'm really, I'm okay. I said, okay. I said, you know, we know what's happening here. Do you have any regrets in life? Right. And, and she goes, yeah, she goes, I wish I was a better mom. And it was, uh, it was, that was like shocking. I was shocked that she said that because I'm like, what do you mean? And, and I told her this, I said, mom, what do you mean? You wish you were a better mom. I said, look, if, if you are an amazing mom, I wouldn't physically be alive right now. I wouldn't be standing by your bedside right? Even if I was healthy and you were a, a bad mom, I wouldn't be by your bedside watching you die. You know, like you were an amazing mom. You did everything that you could, you know, given your circumstance, you were a single mom, you were raising a healthy child and a child that was sick. And, and we're not talking like, oh, little cold sick. We're talking like barely living sick in an age that you couldn't get information you were having difficulty getting information. I mean, unless you were a doctor, which you weren't, you know, you were trying to understand everything that was going on. You were an amazing mom. I said, you need to know this. You know, first and foremost, you need to know this because like you've been my rock. You've been, you've been my solid, my solid person all my life. Like I, I can't even begin to tell you how much I love you and care about you. And, and, you know, and so she was like, okay. You know, she was kind of grateful that I, that I told her that. And I had to work the next day <clears throat> and I almost called in sick and I should have, but I didn't. And my grandma, I was, uh, I was transporting some people. It was actually a, a business trip. I was transporting them basically from, from like one office to another office to another office. And we were actually getting ready to go to lunch and I had to drop them off. Then I was going to come back like an hour and, and pick them up. And as I was dri driving to drop them off, I got a call from my grandmother and she says, you need to come right now. 
And um, it was it was eleven fifty three in the morning, and uh, my mother had passed away, and I I dropped off my clients, and I told them what had happened, and I, I said, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. I need to go. I said, my mother's just passed away. I will have another chauffeur come out uh, and get you. And and they were, I mean, they were obviously very compassionate, right? It, it's it's life. I mean. I, I don't mean to sound very casual, nonchalant about it, but I think maybe it's because I had dealt with this for so long with my mom being in and out of hospitals, knowing that she was sick, but not knowing exactly what the issue was that I just went, okay, you know what, this is, this is what needs to happen. And so there was, there was a part of me that was like blessed and grateful that she was no longer in pain. She was no longer suffering. And, and of course, there was also another part of me that was very sad about that. So moved on, got to the hospital. Yes, she had passed. My son was there. Um, my grandmother, my, my grandmother's friend. And I knew that I had, I had to be the, the, the leader of the pack at that point, right? I, I had to hold everything together. I should back up just a moment real quick. When I was 11 years old, my son was in, my son, excuse me, my brother was in a cave and it caved in on him and crushed and killed him. And so I don't know how I forgot that, that little piece of information. So that was very, very devastating for me. My brother and I were very, very close. He was, you know, in school, he was my, uh, he was my protector. He was definitely the older brother. And we were uh, a little over a year and a half apart and he was just, uh, he was, he was my, he was my best friend. You know, we, we walked to school every day together. He protected me. He used to throw little, <laughs> little pebbles at me, you know, I mean, just typical brother stuff. And so you, he had died. Mm -hmm. My mother was actually in Santa Maria again, north, nine hours north of us. And she was, she was out playing golf and somehow they were able to get a hold of her and all they told her was you need to come home right away there's something wrong with your son well naturally she immediately thought it was me because i'm the one with the condition right, right. My, my brother was perfectly healthy he had no no issues whatsoever and so she uh she had raced home and in the process was pulled over by the chp explained to the chp that there was an issue and the officer would not let her go and so long story short, yeah, oh, long story on. short, there was a whole lawsuit there with the CHP. I mean, it was just one problem after another problem. And so being that this happened in a very small town, again, we knew everybody, right? It, it Not only was it a tragedy for our family, it was a tragedy for the town, right? The whole town like kind of shut down in in honor of, of my brother. We had trees planted at the um, school there. So that was tough. And so after 11 years old, I was a single child, which was easy for me to, to adapt to that in, in that regards. Um, again, I think a lot of it is because of my optimism, right? And I'm still just a very shiny, happy person. So my mother passed away. Sorry. So let me go back to where we were with my mother passing. I went over, my mom had lived in HUD housing at the time. And HUD housing has rules that if if some, you know, if their uh, tenant passes away, they have 14 days to get everything out of the house. So I had, no, I'm sorry, 10 days. I had 10 days to get everything out of her house. And I did. I mean, again, I was working full time, dealing now with my mother's death, her passing, getting everything out of her house, you know, and of course, everything that surrounds the whole death thing and, and you know, the cremation and I mean, just closing out bank accounts and this and that and working and taking care of home. So once some of that started to die down about three weeks later, I'm like, something is, I think I had pneumonia. I was like, I've, I've got pneumonia, which doesn't surprise me. I've been burning the candle at both ends for the better part of six months dealing with my mom. And let's just pause for a second, sure. Jason. Your mom died in January of 2017, correct? Yeah. Okay. And so as you're grieving, as you're dealing with all this, you're getting worse and worse. And so the pneumonia, you're thinking that you had pneumonia was around what month of 2017? It was February of 2017. My mom died January 28th. Oh, okay. Yeah, my mom died yeah. January 28th. Okay. I'm sorry, January 27th of 2017. 
And, and it was literally like three weeks later that I'm like, I, I'm certain I have pneumonia. And so I went to the hospital and obviously went into the ER. The doctors came in, they, you know, checked everything. They ran a bunch of tests and they said, well, we really, we really can't explain, you know, why you're, you're dragging so much. He said, first of all, you do have the flu. It's not pneumonia. I said, okay. That explains it. They go, no, they go, you have pulmonary hypertension because of your heart condition. So what we want to do is we're going to release you and put you on home oxygen. And we want you to follow up with your cardiologist. And I said, let me get my cardiologist in here right now, because this is, this is no, it'll take me weeks to get follow up with my cardiologist. So I called up my cardiologist. I, at this point, I had a very good relationship with my cardiologist. I mean, the first day I met him, he came in and said, hi, I'm Steven. Please call me Steven. He goes, I'm going to learn just as much from you as you are from me. So like, that's how our first conversation started. So we were on a, you know, first name basis and it, it was fantastic. And so I called him and, and he came into the, the uh, hospital right away. They actually admitted me. I was in there for a couple of days because while they were running all these tests and then they were like, yeah, we want to release you on home oxygen. So I called a cardiologist in before they released me. And he goes, Jason, how long, how long have you been experiencing this? I said, well, I don't know, better part of like three weeks or so. Again, I had to kind of go back over the last six months with him as to what was going on in my life because I wanted him to get a full picture. And he said, Jason, I think, I think it may be time for a transplant. What do you think? And I'm like, I'm not, I am not that sick. Like, no way. You know, I, if you think so, then okay. Like I'm willing to. And had y'all been talking about a so, transplant? I mean, the way he just yeah, does that, yeah. it seems I mean, like. Transplants have always been on my back burner, right? Ever since, again, ever since I was six years old, okay. right? My mom and I knew, we always yeah. knew that, that at some point in my life, I'm going to have to have a transplant. Um, we never knew when that was going to happen. We always were like, look, we've been so fortunate. Uh, medical technology has always been like one step ahead of where I've been. Just enough to where they can fix me, they can fix me, they can fix me. And we were getting, you know, so again, yes, transplant was always in, in on the back burner, but it was never, ever like brought to the front because we always thought there was going to be another fix that could happen. So when he said that, I was, I was like, no, you know, I'm not that, I don't feel that sick. And um, he says, okay, well, let's, uh, you know, would you be open to being evaluated for it? I said, sure. You know, I, that's fine. It's not going to hurt me to get evaluated. So he says, okay, well, we have to send you to downtown Sacramento because that's where they do the transplants. I said, okay. So they uh, took me by ambulance downtown Sacramento. I actually wound up being admitted into the hospital for like a full week for that. Yeah, it was like a full week, maybe even, was it two weeks? So it was pretty close to two weeks. And so the transplant team came in, they saw me, they, they did all their tests and they came back to me and they said, okay, so we have a couple of things going on. I'm like, okay. He said, um, half of us think that you need the transplant. The other half thinks that you don't. But the one thing that we all can agree on is we're not going to do it. And I went, what? They said, yeah. They go, we're not qualified to do your transplant because of your, your congenital heart defects, because of your, all your previous surgeries, because of, um, you know, it's, it's so complex. It's far more complex than we would normally do and, and do. So we want you to go to Stanford. And I said, okay. Wow. Yeah. I'm like, okay. And, and they go, oh, and by the way, um, have you ever heard of cirrhosis? And I'm like, yeah, my mom just died of it like three weeks ago. They said, oh, you have. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. What? I'm like, my mom was an alcoholic, like a major alcoholic. She was a day drinker, a night drink. I mean, the minute she got up, she was drinking it. Her, her drink of choice was always wine, generally boxed wine. She could easily go through a box of wine in two days. Like she was a drinker, right? And I knew that all grown up in my, my teenage years. It actually um, really affected us to the point that um, my mom and I stopped talking for the better part of three years. She wasn't around when my son was born. And, and like we, we literally did not talk. I didn't see her for, for three years. So it's ironic how close and tight we, we were prior to that and then how close and tight we became once we got back to discussing and talking with each other. And so I'm like, wow. Wow. so the doctor said, no, 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 you need to understand 
you don't have cirrhosis because of your lifestyle. You have it because of your heart condition. And I'm like, what? And they go, yeah, it's actually specifically because of the surgery, the Fontan, the classic Fontan that you had. And so I'm like, okay, I need you to explain this to me because I have never heard of this. And I, I asked him, I said, can, can you explain this? Because I, I don't, I don't quite understand how this all plays out. Basically, what it is, is that when they do the Fontan procedure, it increases the blood pressures throughout the entire body. Those increased pressures oh. are what created the cirrhosis in my liver. The one thing that they couldn't tell me is how it may have affected any other organs in my body, those increased pressures. So when, you know, like I've always known that the whole body, and, and this is how doctors are now looking at it. They look at the whole body. They don't, I mean, even though you may speak with a cardiologist that's dealing predominantly with your heart, they are now starting to take into effect how it affects the whole rest of your body. Um, they used to never do that. As a child, no, it was, nope, I'm a heart doctor, that's it, period, end of story. I'm a, whatever, liver doctor, period, end of story, you know? And now they're really like, it's just, like I said earlier, it's just amazing where medical technology and how they are training these doctors, how far it's come, because if it was how it is now, Back when I was a kid, I think, I think maybe things would be a lot different, but I don't know, right? It's, it, there's a reason why it's called practicing medicine. They're always practicing oh, yeah. medicine. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. so they were telling me, yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, because of your heart condition that you have cirrhosis. So I said, okay. So they said, because of that, you may also need a liver transplant, a heart and a liver. <laughs> and, and. I was fine. I was totally fine with hearing that I needed a heart transplant. I was ready for that. Okay, no problem. The liver one kind of freaked me out because all my life, all I've ever dealt with is my heart condition. I was perfectly healthy other than my heart condition. And even now, when it comes to my heart, no problems whatsoever. I can deal with that just fine. But if I were to break a leg, oh, oh God, I'm a big baby. You know, it's, 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 it, and so it was kind of the same thing, like liver, I have a problem with my liver. I never felt anything. I never like, I, I, to this day, I have no idea, like if I have liver problems, what that would feel like, or, you know, what that would be like. I don't, I have no idea. I have no clue. I, I haven't even looked it up because I think maybe I'm just afraid that if I were to look it up and go, oh yeah, I did feel that. Oh, I have felt that, you know, like, I don't know. So. So they, uh, they sent me down to Stanford. This was in, it wasn't until July that I had my first appointment, July of 2017, that I had my first appointment to Stanford. So the Sacramento guy sent me home, got me on home oxygen and, and basically said, okay, just stay at home. Don't, you know, don't work, don't this, you know, we'll sign your disability papers, but yeah, you just, you just need to be a homebody and don't overdo it. Well, that's hard to say for me. I'm, I'm a go, go, go person. How do you tell a go, go, go person to settle down? So I did stop working um, and I was doing all kinds of fix it, repair things around the house and, you know, with what I could and with my limitations, um, which were gradually getting worse day by day. But again, like when I was a child, I didn't notice it every day. And it wasn't until just prior to my transplant that I looked back and went, oh, yikes, it's, it's getting really, you know, I've really gotten declined. I've really gone downhill. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of get into more of that here in a, in a moment. So July of 2017 was my first appointment. I think it was like July 20, it doesn't matter. July something. Um, first appointment at Stanford was amazingly impressed. Um, the last time I'd been into a major hospital was when I was 21 years old. So it was, you know, 20, it had been 20, almost, almost 20 years since I've been into, you know, major hospital for a major surgery, right? I've, obviously I've been into my local hospitals for ER stuff, but never like to go see a team and have to do all these tests. And, so I was extremely impressed. Stanford just, uh, their team there just blew me away. Their, I can't say generosity, but just the way that they didn't look at me as a number. 
they looked at me as a patient. And not only did they look at me as a patient, but I was a, like, I was a superstar to them, right? Because I was such a unique case. And I was the oldest Fontan that they had had as a patient there to be seen and to be worked up for transplant. So with that, they were just completely amazed and they wanted, you know, they wanted to study me like everybody else. So um, naturally I said, okay, you can study me. Sure. Everyone else does. And I mean, they just, they took really good care of me. I, I, I didn't see PAs, you know, I saw the head of liver transplant. I saw the head of heart transplant. It wasn't like, you know, a couple of doctors down the line. It was the head of the head. So you know, they, they certainly treated me with white gloves and wanted to make sure to get me set up um, to the point that they, they were even like, okay, we need for you to go and see the ear, nose, and throat doctor and figure out what's going on with your sinuses. Uh, okay. Like, yeah, they were, they were adamant about getting everything fixed. Really? Everything? Cool. I've been waiting for this yeah. forever. To get you the best the best yeah, chance well, exactly. of survival, and, right? Like right, what's the point right. of doing we, a transplant if your sinuses were going to take you out? Right. But, but see at, the, at that point, I mean, I'm, I was so new to transplant. I didn't know, right? Like I knew nothing about transplant other than I needed one or I, I was told I needed one. Again, I didn't really feel that I was that sick. And so by through all the workups, um, they actually did do a sinus surgery on me. Um, that was September of 2017. And then by December, the liver guys listed, had me listed for transplant and the heart guys were still kind of being wishy-washy. Yeah. On the fence about wanting to list me, but because the liver guys did the heart guys went, oh shoot, we have to catch up because the heart guys take priority. So. It wasn't until um, February that I got listed for the heart. So by February of 2018, I was fully listed for the heart and liver. Well, one night in November of 2017, I had insomnia, just couldn't sleep, didn't want to keep Jen awake. So I went into the living room, pulled out the laptop and just started reading through my medical charts. I was just curious as to what they had in there. And I'm you know, reading the stuff. I'm like, oh, okay. They, they kind of got that wrong, but okay, whatever. Like they diagnosed me with, with HLHS, um, uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And I believe the reason why they did that is because all of my symptoms were very similar to what HLHS patients go through. And so whatever it, it like didn't really matter, but it did. So anyways, I kept reading, kept reading. I come across hepatocellular carcinoma and I went, Okay, I know what carcinoma is. So, of course, okay. now this is three o'clock in the morning. So, I'm looking it up. Liver cancer. I said, wait a minute. I have liver cancer? Like, they never I, told cancer? you? Like, nobody, no, they, nobody's told me of this. Nobody. So, at three o'clock in the morning, I'm calling my liver doctor. And of course, I left a message. They call me back the next day. Oh, nobody told you? No. So can you explain this to me? Well, look, we'll have, actually, I, I want to think it was like the, the PA or someone had called me. I don't know. It, no, it might've even been just a nurse. A nurse had called me. I am aghast. Oh yeah. Oh you're, yeah. You're not the only one. Now I, did I tell you that day? I, okay. So I told Jen, you? yeah, I told her, but I was like, I didn't want to tell her. Right. Because I mean, I didn't know. I, I didn't, so I'm one of those people that, and, and especially with my grandmother, cause my grandmother really freaks out. I don't tell people things until I know like a whole lot of details because I, I don't want to get bombarded with all these questions that I can't answer. So I kind of hold a lot of information until I have more details and then I will tell them. And I'm also one that I don't, I've always, I always say, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Like that's just my nature, right? I don't, um, I don't freak out about things until it comes to that point. And, and I just, I deal with them, you know? So I told Jen, the nurse had called me and she's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll let the doctor call you. And of course, I don't know. I don't even remember the timeline, like how far along it was, but uh, before the doctor called me. So the doctor calls me, she says, okay, so here's the deal. She says, you have a 
by 1.8 centimeter cancer in your liver. There is nothing that we can do until it hits two centimeters. And then at that point, we can start chemo, radiation, you know, whatever they, they've got to do. So because there's nothing we can do, we're just going to monitor it. I'm like, okay. I said, there, is it growing fast? Do we, like, can you tell me? They said, no. They go, we, we just discovered it, but it's, it's so small that, again, there's, we can't do anything. We, we just got to wait. And it's on an organ. Yeah, and it's on an organ that's that, destined to be gotten rid of, removed. right? Removed. Okay. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. Now, again, could the heightened blood pressure that I've gotten from my surgery when I was six years old that caused my cirrhosis, could that have caused my cancer? Absolutely. So, you know, this wow. is why I say you don't know. We don't know what those, how it affects other organs, right? How it affects my brain. Yeah, it's a like downstream any, thing, right? It really is. And, and so again, the yeah. whole, you know, it's the whole body. It's not, it's not just the heart, just the liver. It's how, how has my heart condition affected my entire body? And so fully listed in March, in February of 2018 for both the heart and the liver. Now it's a waiting game. So it, you know, I fill my days with, I would go out and walk my dogs every day. Um, I was still bike riding. I was still you know, I would walk on average about three miles, four miles a day, you know, it wasn't like I was still very active, but they didn't want me to work. So, okay, fine, whatever. So I just stayed at home and, you know, made friends with all the retired people at the dog park and you know, just kind of lived as, as best I could. Kind of nice, but it sucks because all your friends are at work. So it's not like you can call up your friends, say, hey, come on over, let's hang out. So, um, on January 27th, 2019, at 11.53 in the morning, which was three years to the exact day, time, hour, second that my mother passed away, I got a phone call that said, Mr. Crutchley, we have a heart and liver for you. It was a Sunday morning. I was at work. Jen was at work. We were, uh, I, I had actually called my cousin and my uncle and aunt to come over for, for lunch. I was actually barbecuing at the time. And they were, they were scheduled to be there at noon. And so when you get that call, um, it, there's a couple of, of ways that that can go down. In my case, I actually got a call from the surgeon, which sometimes is rare. The reason why I got the call from the surgeon is the surgeon told me, your donor or the donor is a known IV drug user. So because of that, it's considered a high risk uh, transplant. And if you are ever offered a high risk transplant, you have the opportunity to decline it because of it being a high risk and it won't affect your status as far as where you're, you're at on the list. Oh. Yeah. And so uh, wow. a high risk, like in my case, he was an IV drug, he was a IV drug user, but Obviously, his organs were still good. I mean, so I, I don't know a whole lot of details about my donor, and we'll get into that shortly. <clears throat> so they had to tell me that because it's, again, that they, they are required to tell you when it's uh, high risk because, like I said, you, you have the opportunity to decline it. In my case, I was declining so rapidly that by this point, I was on four liters of oxygen pretty much full time. And I could not bend over and tie my shoes. I could not put my socks on. I couldn't reach into the, the washing machine and pull out laundry. Basically, anything that had me to, to bend over or stoop, um, I couldn't do any of that because it, it just, I couldn't breathe like at all. Um, I was so short of breath. I expected that if, if I, looking back now, like if I didn't get that call when I did, I think I would have had a, about a month left to live. I knew at that time that I wasn't going to make it to this summer. I, I absolutely knew that. And so three years to the exact date and time I got the call, you know, my mom's death. And, and I thought, wow, how crazy is that? And so doctor says, look, it's a high risk. Uh, I said, nope. I said, let's, let's do this. I said, I'm, I'm ready. He says, okay. He says, um, you know, get down here to Stanford. I said, okay. I said, look, it's, it's a Sunday, like everybody. So we lived, 
just outside of Sacramento. From Sacramento to Stanford, it's about a two and a half hour drive. And on a Sunday, it can take up to six to seven to eight hours to get there because of all the Bay Area traffic that was up in Reno or in Tahoe heading home for, you know, the week. So I asked him, I said, hey, do you like, do you need to call Life Flight? I, I'm a member of Life Flight. You know, do you need to call them to have me flown in there? He says, no, 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 take your time. And I thought, take my time. Like <laughs> when you go through this whole thing, they tell you, you have to be within four hours of the hospital. Like there is no take your time. And uh, so I thought, okay, well, that's, that's kind of weird, but okay, whatever. So got off the phone with him. And no sooner did I get off the phone with him, my aunt and uncle come walking in. And I tell him, I said, guys, I, I, I'm so sorry. I have to postpone this. And like, they must've seen the look on my face because mm -hmm. they, they were like, he goes, what's wrong? My uncle says, what's wrong? I said, I got the call. I have a heart and liver. He, my, my, my uncle, God bless him. The action, right? Oh, <laughs> he, he turned around and bolted out that door. He's like, we're out of here. We're going to see you down there. And I'm like, uh, okay. Like, I think he was out that door before I could even finish telling him that I had a heart and liver waiting for me. It was, a, it was such... Uh, I mean, and when you get that call, like every emotion that you have, every single one that you can think of, not just for me, but for Jen, like for everybody that I told, that emotion goes through you. And, and it all goes through so fast, but it's like constant. It, it's a constant. It's one minute you're, you're super excited. One minute you're scared to death. One minute you're, you know, laughing about it. One minute you're crying, you know, it's, and it, but it's just constant, constantly revolving. And, and it, for me, like that emotion, yeah, that, that lasted all the entire, all the way up into that night that, you know, we were trying to sleep in the hospital. So it, you got there in time. Yeah. So, yeah. So bizarrely. So of course I called Jen, Hey, you need to get home. I got the call. We got to go. She's like, okay. Um, we had already had bags packed. Uh, they, that's kind of one of the things that they train you when you do transplant, um, uh, have a bag, a go bag ready. I'm a, I'm a volunteer for the Red Cross, so I deployed in major disasters in the country. So I'm used to having a go bag always, you know, available, ready for me. So I kind of already had that prepped and ready. Um, and for us, it was, it was actually very easy to have it ready. Of course, we didn't realize until now that we way overpacked, but whatever. You, you discover those things later. So, um, so yeah, so we uh, called the kids, called all of our support teams, you know, notified everybody that we had to and started driving down there. Jen, myself, and the kids, Jen has two kids, um, and then I have my one. So we have three kids between it's us. Kind of how we met is my daughter and his son were in kindergarten together. All the way up we to fifth grade. Yeah, but we never knew. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. And, and in, in fifth mm -hmm. grade, they were doing a, uh, a skate night at, at the local roller rink and... Uh, my son fell and hurt himself. He wasn't there. Yeah, I wasn't there. And I grew up on roller skates. I was a championship roller skater. So I recognized the fall and the injury. And my mom was a, a, a nurse. So I took all of that to care for. Oh, my daughter, Elizabeth, came and got me and said, hey, my friend uh, fell and got hurt. You need to help him. And so uh, that's where I started doing the checkpoint, looking to see what was injured what was possibly broken and he comes over and no, no, no you're late you're late this is this is my <laughs> deal i've got this and then he does a macgyver and uh takes a uh, cardboard and starts wrapping his arm into in like a makeshift splint i said okay he just got one point but then i never carry coins in my in my pocket so i said he's not going anywhere we're still having a good time my daughter took him over to the video game, got him some food so that he, at least they were kind of now winding down from fun. And an injury is not going to, you know, take precedence over being out with friends. And so dad was winning at the video game. So I had to check in and go, these are my quarters. He needs to win. <laughs> so that's how, that's how we met. Yeah. That, that's how we met. Where that is, is adorable. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I, you know, to thank her, I said, hey, you know, um, the Chipmunks movie had just come out. I said, Let, let's, 
you know, can I take you and the kids and we'll go see the Chipmunks movie. And um, she's like, yeah, sure. So we exchanged numbers and we're driving home. She, she texts me. She goes, hey, uh, I'm not following you, but I'm your neighbor. And I went, what? There's no way. Like, there's no way. Yeah, we were both in Roseville School District. But living we outside. Lived, yeah, we lived outside the school districts. We both had to do like inner city district transfers, right? For the kids to go to Roseville schools. And uh, sure enough, I mean, she lived in the apartment complex right next door to mine. And she was in the building. Like she was second building from the, from the back. I was second building from the back. She was on the right side. I was on the left side. So we were literally separated by a fence. It, yeah, it was just, it that was just crazy. crazy. And then her son's name is Jason. I'm a Jason. My great grandmother's last name is Carter. Her maiden name is Carter. I mean, just the similarities. It's, it's the synchronicity. Yeah. yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, th things happen for a reason, right? Oh, yeah. So, and um, then fast forward, well, now you're on your way to a transplant. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. And so we're, um, we're driving down. We call the support system. So all of us were scheduled to go on a cruise the following week. So I'm like calling the cruise ships. I'm calling like everybody. Oh, no, it's two weeks later. Two weeks later, we were going on a cruise. So, you know, I'm calling our everybody that we got to call to cancel this and do this. Uh, it was it was wild trying to like, fortunately, we had that drive, right? We had time to like do all this stuff. So uh, we did all that. We get there to Stanford. And by this time, it's five o'clock in the evening on a Sunday. It's a ghost town. Like we're walking the halls going, this is really eerie. Yeah. Right. Like, where do we go? No, they didn't tell us where to go. They just said, get down here. So nobody yeah. is around to answer questions. I mean, I don't even see a doctor or a nurse walking the hall or a patient like nobody. But we the the, the ER store is closed. Yes. Yeah. ER. I'm like, hey, ER is open 24 hours a day. Let's go there. So went there, got checked in and uh, they were like, oh, yeah. And they from there, they kind of led us to where we had to go. So. They took us to a, a room, which, which was, you know, any regular hospital room. And, and sure enough, I mean, from there, it was just go, 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 go. They jumped into action and, okay, we've got to do this test and this test and this and this, x-rays and bloods and all this stuff. And then the doctor comes in to talk to us. And he says, hey, uh, welcome to transplant life. Hurry up and wait. Come again? He says, yeah. So we scheduled your transplant for 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And I'm thinking to myself. Oh. Why? I thought we had like, a four-hour window. Yeah, where? Yeah, yeah. Where, where's your window at? Like, I'm so confused. Why am I here right uh -huh. now? You know, like I could right, have a little right. bit more time to, I don't know, hang out, family, friends, whatever. So um, that was when, um, you know, again, he kind of reiterated the whole yes, you're, you know, he had this uh, this IV drug issue, and so they had to go over all all the. They told me is, oh, yeah, um, the doctors are going to fly over and look at the heart. They got to put eyes in the prize and then they'll bring it over, blah, blah, blah. So they, they he kind of went through the whole process with me. And then after like, I don't know, after a couple of hours of chaos where it's, you know, we got to get all these labs done and these x-rays and CTs and this and that. Then all of a sudden, I think by that time it was like nine o'clock at night and it's just Jen and I. I, I mean, again, the, the thrill, the, the emotion still have not died down. You know, we're still, but I think more so at that point, the fear started to set in. The what ifs started to set in more. But I still was very, very arrogant, you know, confident. Oh, I got this. This is nothing. This will be a walk in the park. And so it, it, it was really like that night we just held each other. You know, we, we laid in bed. And we just held hands and I don't think we really did a lot of talking. We just kind of, we were, you know, I think we were just taking in the moment with each other and nothing, uh, nothing crazy. So next day, get up, kids. you know, kids, kids start showing up. Like lots of stuff was going on, but not going on. It's again, just really a weird vibe. Cause you don't, I don't know what to expect. I didn't know what exactly was happening. And I'm like, okay, now I'm, I'm kind of getting antsy at this point. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to put some more miles on my heart. So I go out and I started to walk <laughs> in the halls and I wound up walking another mile and a half before my transplant. And, wow. and again, still just was like, 
I can't believe that I'm, I'm going in for a transplant. Like I'm not, I'm not that sick. I never, ever felt that I was so sick that I needed to have a heart transplant. And then I remember assigning the, you know, all the, the forms that you got to sign, right? As you go through any kind of surgery. And I remember telling my son, I said, you know, son, one of these days you're going to buy a house and you're going to think that you're signing your life away. That's exactly what dad is doing right now. <laughs> Literally signing my life away. <laughs> I had to have it notarized, like everything, right? It was, it was pretty bizarre. And, mm -hmm. and then they're like, okay, we need for you to shave. And I'm like, oh yeah, why already took care of that? They go, oh no, everywhere. Yeah, I, I got that. They go, no, no, no. Give me your arms. Like we're shaving your arms. We're shaving your legs. I'm like, what? Blew me away. They shaved every, except for my head, they shaved every part of me. I'm like, okay, that I didn't expect. That was bizarre. And then, um, you know, I'm getting wheeled in to the OR, said, I, I don't say goodbyes. It's nope. I'll see he you says, later. I'll see you on the other side. Yep. I'll see you later. Because again, yeah. I just yep. I went into it very confident. I got this. Very, yeah. I just went in. I was, I was mm -hmm. arrogant. I say arrogant because I, it's like, yeah, I was just, I was so confident that things are going to be fine. This is walk in the park. I got this. No big deal. And um, when they finally got me into the OR, which by the way, if, you, if you've never been wheeled into an OR and you're still awake, it's very unnerving because you know what you're going in there to do. And, you know, and then, I mean, it, it's, it's such a, and I'm trying to remain calm and breathing, you know, doing all the exercises that I can to try and be cool and calm and collective and myself funny and, you know, witty as, as, as always. And, uh, I get in there and I'm like, this is such a small OR. And the guy the the doctor's like, Oh no, it's, it's perfect. I'm like, yeah, but they told me that there's going to be like 30 to 40 people in here. And they said, Oh yeah. I'm like, there's no way. Like there's, it, it looked like it was maybe a 10 by 10 room. <laughs> Maybe it was my perspective because it's laying down. I don't know. But I was like, there's no way you're going to fit this many people because again, they wanted, they had to have the heart transplant team. They had to have the liver transplant team. They had to have the pediatric transplant team. They had to have um, all the other doctors that were training that were there to learn because again, I'm, so I was the 19th heart and liver combo that Stanford had ever done. So because of that, I'm part oh of that, that group of people that they, they will use my case along with the 18 before me as a, as a training, right. Tool for, for future transplants. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's like, wow, you, you have this many people in there and I was, you know, and then, okay, need you to slide over to the bed. Uh, okay, you know, we're onto the the hospital table, which shocked me. That was the first time I laid down on a on a hos on a OR table, and it was actually comfortable. And I'm like, this is weird. Like every other one that I've laid down on, it's been hard and cold and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you know, your spasms have and the size like, of a postage stamp. Yeah, it's yeah. Like it's like <laughs> it's yeah. so small. And um, and I, mm -hmm. you know, and then I recall that. They had, had brought my arms straight out, like, you know, like I was being nailed to the cross and strapping me down. And I'm like, oh, this is like, this is really getting, and yeah, at that point I was really starting to kind of freak out about it. And right about that time is when, when they put me under and, and I'm like, okay. And I, I do remember saying a prayer just before I went under and, um, again, still very confident confident that that it was going to turn out okay that there wasn't going to be any problems and then i woke up and went holy moly what is going on it was is the first time i'd ever look at him and saw what fear looked like on him i'd never seen fear wow. before on his face it was bizarre so i went through a lot of icu delirium and if you, if you don't know what that is, first of all, you can always check out icudelirium.com. It's, it's literally what it implies. It is delirium that happens generally when you're in the ICU. A lot of it is because of the fact that you're in a foreign place, the medications that they have you on, whether it's the pain meds, in my case, because I was doped up with all kinds of pain meds, steroids, you know, all the anti-rejection medications, like there was so much going on with my body, the trauma that your body goes through. So all that leads up to ICU delirium. 
ICU delirium only happens in adults. It does not happen in children. So because of that, I'd never experienced it before. I didn't even know it existed. I didn't even know, like nobody had told me about ICU delirium in the, you know, live, coming up to my transplant. No one ever mentioned, hey, there's a chance that you could have ICU delirium. I wish that they would have told me that. I wish they would have given me that website so I could have looked it up before my transplant. So I would, ha I, I had crazy, crazy, crazy delirious dreams that were very vividly real to me. And I, I know like a lot of them, I, I, I can't say I blocked them out per se, but I, a lot of them I don't remember. But there are some that I remember. Um, one of them was that I was in, again, went through my transplant and I was trying to get my, me my medications and I'm in a drug house. And in this drug house was a heavy set Hispanic male, a half naked woman. Um, it was a very dark room. There was one candle that was lit and that, that candle was like, it was very hard on my eyes, it was very hard for me to see. And then I started realizing that there's bodies on the ground. And the Hispanic male had taken some tequila, poured tequila on a rope that led up to one of the bodies and then lit that rope on fire. And it, it caught that body on fire. Once that body was put out, he cut into the body and pulled out my medication and said, here you go, here's your meds. And, and oh again, my God. And, and, and it was vividly real. Like it was a nightmare, yeah. but I thought it was reality. Another one was that my son, who my son does IT work. And so he works from home a lot. So he came to my hospital, obviously, you know, check on dad. And he would stay with me and he would do his work on his laptop in, in, my, in my ICU. Well, in my delirium, he was hacking into Stanford and was selling medical information to the black market. And the black market was telling me to tell him he needs to pay them more money or needs to give them more, more information or else they're not going to give the doctors access to my medications. And so in reality, what was happening is my son was sitting there typing away on his computer, right? Just doing his work. The nurses would come in and you know, I like the nurses would scan their badge to log onto their computer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those scans wouldn't, they wouldn't go through. They'd have to scan it twice, three times, whatever. Well, that's what these nurses were doing. But in my delirium, they weren't getting access because the black market guys were like, hey, your son needs to give us more of this information. And, and I'm like sitting there looking at my son going, what are you doing? Like, you are literally killing me right now because I can't get my meds. So it's delirium, just weird things. Yes, I did see bugs. Yes, I, you know, the clock on the wall. And so you're communicating like, all this, right, to them? And no, are they saying back to you? No. Oh, you couldn't? No, no, no. So oh. I couldn't communicate. I was trait. I had oh, no still movement still trait. my hands. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't move my body. I was strapped to the bed. Yes. I couldn't talk. I was so swollen. I couldn't hold a pen or anything to. So, yeah. I, and even like we were trying to play charades, like we tried a million different things. She was trying to sign to me and I couldn't. I'm like, I don't understand sign language. You know, like it's there was no way for me to tell. And the, the thing about that is that the doctors would come in every day and they would ask me very basic questions. What's your name? Where are you? What is today's date? Why are you here? And I would tell these doctors everything that they wanted to hear. It wasn't what was going on in my brain, but it's everything that they wanted mm -hmm. to hear. So in my delirium, I was in Japan or I was in a dentist's office or I was in a crack house or you know what I mean? But I wouldn't tell them that. Yeah. I would tell them I'm here at Stanford. I had my transplant. It was two days ago, you know, or whatever. Today's date is this date. The reason why the doctors are asking you this is because they're trying to determine if you are in delirium or not. And again, I knew none of this, right? Like all this stuff was explained to me after I was released from the hospital about ICU delirium and such. So my delirium kept going on and on. It actually lasted for about three and a half weeks. And it wasn't until something inside of me said, this isn't right. It's not reality. And it's got to be because of the medications you're on, the pain meds. Tell them to stop giving you pain meds. Deal with the pain, stop the pain meds. And I don't know how I was able to communicate that, but I, I was. And of course, the doctors were like, no, 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 no. We, you know, we want to, we want to give you sleeping meds and we want to, you're not sleeping at night. I'm like, yeah, I'm not sleeping at night because I'm scared to death. Like right. a, a very common ICU delirium that, that 
almost all people go through is that either the doctors or their spouses are trying to kill them. In my cases, it was the doctors and the nurses were trying to kill me. And the way that they were trying to kill me was through my, uh, my IV. They were, you know, giving me med, my IV. So I actually went and ripped out my IV in, in my delirium. I, and this is why they, they had to t tie me to the bed because I ripped out my IV, except that it wasn't my IV. It was my art line. And so the nurse came in. She's like, oh my God, there's freaking blood everywhere. And I'm like, oh, relax. It's just my IV. I didn't know it was my art line that I pulled out. So they had to redo that. Yeah, it was, it was very tragic. It, it, um, I, mm -hmm. I actually developed uh, PTSD uh, because of my ICU delirium. Mm -hmm. And I'm and so glad, Jason, that you're sharing this because this is such an important piece of oh, the transplant. Really or, I mean, this is, I mean, I'm, my heart is breaking for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you thank for you. sharing it because it's like, this is so unfortunate. And yeah. this probably, like you just alluded to it, you develop PTSD, which we can get to in a short bit. Right. But Jesus, how long were you in the ICU for? I was in the ICU for three and a half weeks. And then I was in a step down okay. unit for another two and a half weeks. So total five and a half weeks that I was in the hospital. Mind you, in the bed the entire time. So because of that, yeah. once they finally started to get me up and move me around, I had to learn how to walk again. I had to learn how to talk again because the trach had damaged my vocal cords. And so I literally had to learn how to talk again. I had to learn how to write all over again because my hands were so swollen that I, I couldn't figure out how to hold, you know, a pen or write or anything like that. Uh, in fact, I still have uh, the notes that I would write to Jen or attempt to write to Jen. They were clear to him. They were clear, yeah, crystal clear to me. But, mm -hmm. and even now, like I look at him like, what the heck was I trying to say here, you know? And she goes, yeah, that's what I was trying to read. And I'm like, hey. So the transplant happened um, and it wasn't until February 17th. So that window, he could speak and then he was getting sick. And in order to protect the organs, they had to up his medication in order to protect something was going on because he was going in, in and out of fevers. So he was declining. And then they had a conversation with me in order to save him, we're going to need to trach him. And I said, we didn't talk about that. Yeah. We, we never had that conversation. Mm -hmm. So they said, that is the decision that you need to make. And I said, then bring in the surgeon. I need to hear it from the surgeon because that's what Jason would do. And so I made that decision to, mm -hmm. to trach him without him. That's the first time that I had to step in and say, I'm making a decision in order to save him. And he woke up, he was so frustrated and angry because Jason is so vocal and verbalizes all of his thoughts, feelings, emotion. I know this medication is affecting me this way. This, change this because I know how my body functions. So I had taken that away from him and now became first physician and now advocating trying to understand maybe what I could extract from his, I got a lot of eye rolling. He, he got a lot of eye muscle <laughs> exercises in at first. Oh so, God. But it was, you know, it was one of those things where I had to be strong enough because he was angry that now he could not communicate. I couldn't communicate. So all. that's where he got lost in his head. That's where I, I had to go into everything I had learned from him over the 12, 13 years we were together. And music was something that he could relax to and it wasn't relaxing him. And then, you know, find that medium to where it was jazz music. Mm -hmm. He found peace in the jazz mm -hmm. music that I accidentally found uh, in order to help him relax. Uh, communicating to the nurses around him that he was not a patient. This is Jason, did you know? Jason would relax when I'd start telling uh, the nurse about uh, how he was uh, a wine tour specialist and have you been to Napa? And Jason would perk and pay attention. <laughs> and it was then they started having conversations with him to where, uh, did you know that Jason is a day person? 
he's you have him in the morning in a dark area of the hospital and they did they did this whole promenade of his bed and all the machinery to the other side of the hospital and jason you know perked up with his energy levels and during the day because of uh having the sunshine in the morning he was a morning person yeah so yeah um advocacy you're advocating yeah well she brought a really good point too like my transplant first of all i understand that everything i'm i'm saying it's my story it it doesn't mean that it's going to happen to other transplant recipients and that's the biggest thing that i communicate with any anybody that we mentor this is my story i have many friends that have had a much more difficult time with transplant i have other friends that uh, did even better than I did. So it's everybody's different, right? And, and because of that, everyone reacts differently with the medications and, you know, their organs and what have you. So my transplant, yes, immediately after transplant, I was awake, I was alert, things were, were going really well. And it wasn't until day after Super Bowl Sunday that that I declined and declined quickly. And they, they couldn't figure out what was going on. When did they figure out it actually was? There's a combination. Uh, your body was going through shock. The me- they had to balance out the medication. They weren't sure if it was rejection. The, there was, they backed into uh, eventually understanding that the liver was sewn in too tight. Um, That's right. That's what it was. And it caused an infection. And so it, it, they were... Sewn in too tight? Yes. I'm just trying to so, picture that, like. So they, yes, we had several. Like visits. too many stitches? Had, like. They had to put in stents to widen the area. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, maybe the arteries were occluded? Uh, yeah. the connection. They just, it was explained as the connection. Yeah. I don't know. So I'm thinking arteries were occluded or something then. That's maybe. what I'm making up. Like too maybe. tight. Yeah, I, I really. And especially since you mentioned stents. Yeah, so they had to do um, they yeah. had to do these stents that wow. every, how often was that? Every three weeks they had to go in and add another stent? Yeah, I think it was like every three weeks they had because to go in slip. and do another stent. And then three weeks later, another stent. And they did a total of five stents. Dude. Yeah, so it, it was, you know, I had complications, right? And yeah, fortunately, uh, they were resolved they figured them out and here i am now you know so but with even with all those complications i've never had any rejection none like every time they've gone in and have done the biopsies i've been grade zero rejection and rejection is rejection is very much misunderstood everyone thinks oh my gosh you have rejection that's it you're done no it's not it's not the case all the rejection is basically is like imagine that you're on a train and the train is just cruising down the path and something blocks that path and now the train has to divert and go a different route uh, so rejection there's there's like four different stages of rejection um, there's actually more than four but it's broken down into four um so obviously one through four most people will will experience like type one or type two rejection and basically, all that means is that the plan that they have you on, the medication plan that they have you on, is not working. So they just have to alter it. Sometimes it's adding another medication. Sometimes it's getting rid of one. You know, it's, it's a fine balancing act, right, with transplant. Because they want to keep you healthy enough that the slightest bug isn't going to keep, kill you. But at the same time, they want to keep your immune system suppressed enough that it's not going to attack your new organs. So it's it's a very, very difficult balancing act that they have to face. And that's where rejection comes into play is that that balancing act is off kilter, it's off balance. And in my case, it's been spot on. They've had no issues once, you know, once the, the initial, probably like the first, the first three months of transplant is the most challenging. Because that's when they're first figuring out all of your medications, what works, what doesn't work. After that, it gradually gets better. But all being said, the first year of transplant is, that's like your, your, your golden hour, if you will, of, of transplantation, of, of care. 
So after your first year, you're pretty much set with where you're at, generally speaking. But the first year is the hardest because your body is still trying to get used to it. Even though it takes six weeks to heal, it's still, it's, it's, your body goes through it a major trauma, right? Major, major trauma. Not just because of the fact of the surgery, but also because you have a foreign object. You have, a, you have someone else's organs. In Two, you. in your case. My case, too. And in, in some other people's yeah. cases, it's three and four. Mm -hmm. and, it, and It's an infantile stage because yeah. any bacteria, you're, you become very sensitive to. Yeah. So, okay. um, yep. So that, the first year of transplant, you're wearing a mask. And it's not, it's not like the little paper mask that, you know, we all have to wear right now with COVID. These are N95 respirator, like the kind that you would use to go and paint your garage with, you know, they're heavy mm -hmm. duty respirator mask. And to, if you've never worn one, they're a challenge, you know, you, especially in my case, cause I had to learn how to walk all over again. I had, my feet felt like they were cinder blocks. They were so heavy. And then I have this giant mask on that I can barely see, you know, I can't bend over because of, of all the chest, you know, being cut open, ripped open. So there are a lot of challenges, right? A lot of challenges. Transplant is a lifestyle change. It is a complete lifestyle change. Anything that you went into transplant with, you do not come out of transplant with. And what I mean by that is that if you may be used to, so I was a meat and potatoes guy prior to transplant. After transplant, uh, first of all, I had no appetite whatsoever for like the first six months. Like, well, no, mm -hmm. less than that. It was a little, like for three months, I had no, no appetite. So it was actually an ideal time for me to switch over to a plant slant diet. And that's what I did. So I, I've since, like, regrettably gone kind of back over to more of a meat and potatoes diet. But I'm, I'm trying to get back onto my, my, uh, plant slant because it, it, I was much healthier. I, I felt it. I knew it. Like I could see it. And so again, a lifestyle change, right? Like and we didn't eat out. Yeah. And that's it too. You can't, you can't eat out for the first year mm -hmm. after transplant because you're, yeah, you just have like, to be so careful, right? Well, you're under, I was under yeah. uh, an extreme amount of dietary restrictions. So I, I was on a low sugar because transplant gave me diabetes. So now I'm on a low sugar, low sodium, low fat diet. So I can have water. Wow. Right. Like that's. And that's I mean, frustrating. It's very frustrating because, and then on top of that, everything, everything washed. has to be washed with soap and water. Anything that goes in your mouth has to be washed with soap and water, including things like, oh, I don't know, avocados. And you, you go, well, wait a minute. I don't eat the outside of avocados. No, but you cut through them. And the minute that you slice right, right through mm -hmm. it, all that bacteria will go right through that avocado. So you have to wash everything. Lettuce. How do you wash cilantro? You ever thought about that one? I'll tell you how. Would you put it, submerge it in water with uh, hydro it, hydrogen peroxide? Uh, we, we just submerged it in Dawn dish soap, soapy water. Oh. And, wow. you know, okay. put it down in the water, run it around, kind of, you know, and then pull it up, rinse it really good. So yet we had to do that with everything and for the first year. So again, you know, it takes two weeks to establish a habit. Well, you got to imagine you got to do this for a full year. So you have a whole new habit, whole new lifestyle. I used to never wash my vegetables before transplant, you wash know, wash a watermelon before you cut yeah, it up. Yeah, or wash a watermelon before you cut it up. Like who yeah. thinks to do that? Nobody does, but you have to do that. So it is a huge lifestyle change. Anytime I go out now, and even now, uh, for I'm, I'm four years post transplant at this point, a little over four years. If it's windy, if the wind is above uh, six miles an hour, I have to wear a mask. I have to wear that same respirator that I wore the minute I got released from the hospital. Anytime it's windy like that, anytime I'm doing yard work around road construction, any kind of construction, especially where dirt is being stirred up, because in dirt is aspergillus. Aspergillus is a mold fungus and it's traditionally found in soils, but it's also found in air. The irony of that is prior to transplant, I discovered I was allergic to aspergillus. So I'm allergic to air. How cool is that? Not cool. Um, not cool. So, that is not cool. But, 
<laughs> not cool. Well, you got to breathe, right? But for transplant recipients, aspergillus is like, that's, that's deadly. It's death for us because it's, again, it's a mold fungus. It's very, it's microscopic. So you can't see it. But again, it's found in a lot of soils. So anytime I mow the lawn, if, you know, we happen to be out and let's say maybe there's a, a landscaper nearby that's mowing a lawn, you know, anywhere nearby, I've got to stay away from it because aspergillus could get stirred up and into me. So it's, it's just, it's a huge life. So yeah, I got to wear my mask now. If it's really windy, well, anything above six miles an hour, which it's, you know, if you know, it's six miles an hour is not a big wind. That's an, that's a nice breeze. Like I normally I'd be like, oh, this feels so mm -hmm. great. Nope. Not anymore. Now, actually what it does, it causes anxiety. So, and we just discovered, so we're new to Virginia. We moved out here about seven months ago with word, Virginia, this place gets windy a lot. Just so my anxiety is always through the roof around here. <clears throat> and so there's the wind you got to worry about, construction. If you're driving through road construction, you got to turn on the circulation in your vehicle so that you're not getting the outside. But right after transplant, they're so adamant about it that it's, it's actually, you become like a germaphobe and, a, and very paranoid with that kind of stuff. So again, it's, it's this whole lifestyle change that you go through just to survive. And bringing our friends on board to educate them so that when they prep any food for Jason, we almost bring our own food yep. because they don't have the same habits that we have in order to yeah, and, well, and they, maintain they, our lifestyle. And they don't understand it because they're not going through it, right? And even yeah. like, even now we still will have friends that will come over and maybe he's, you know, coughing or, or is sick. And it's like, dude, I told everybody this time and time again. If you are sick, don't come over. Just tell me. I'm not offended, but I have to know. You know, you can't, you mm -hmm. can't just think, yeah. oh, it, I, I just had this minor cough. It's nothing. Fine. It's nothing for you, but it can kill me. You know, and, right. and we've had, a, we've had friends just show up. Oh yeah. You know, uh, our daughter is at home because she's sick. What? Okay. If she's sick. And she's at home. You need to be at home. I can't be around you. I understand that you feel mm -hmm. fine, that you're healthy, but I can't be around you. You know, it, it's, it's a paranoia that, that I go through. And I think really Jen kind of goes through it too sometimes because I know like immediately after transplant, she was like, oh, don't do that. Oh, don't, you know, really just jumping on things. And I get it. I mean, it's because it's my life. Wait, I was a roadblock to many of our friends. Because when the, I spoke to the surgeon, the surgeon says, when we give him to you, you're responsible for him. And that was a big deal. I had to make sure that that responsibility that I had was taken seriously and educate all of our friends as to, you know, Safety with the visit, <laughs> wearing a mask, uh, washing food. And yeah, I had to, I had to be able to be that support system. To where everybody wanted to come see him after transplant. And I said, nope. Yeah. I waited till he was stronger and literally only the day before and the day of him getting out of the hospital to give him time for uh, friends and family to to be there for him. Because I wanted the, the best type of transition from the hospital setting to a home setting, which was the uh, hotel for the next two months. Wow. That... It's a lot to take in. <laughs> it's it really is, and uh, and you well, know the education part is so key with our friends and and even our family. I mean, there was times that you know my son would slip up and maybe he wouldn't wash his hands, and it's like, hey, I need for you to wash your hands. You don't understand how important this is. <laughs> you know, uh, even in my job now, friends that smoke. Yeah, people they that smoke. To, they had to change clothes before they entered our house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like there's mm -hmm. so many things to it that it's, it's very in depth. It's not. And that's why, uh, when it comes to transplant, the doctors are very cautious about, you know, they're not just going to say, Hey, you know, you need to transplant. It's not, it's not that easy. You've got to go through a lot of obstacles to get that transplant, you know, to be accepted on the transplant list and, and the doctor, everything. I mean, like, 
I would have, I had to see psychologists before they even put me on the transplant list because a psychologist had to clear me and say, yeah, he's, he's a, a stable guy, you know, or not only mm-hmm. is he stable, but he is mentally prepared for the transplant. If you're not mentally prepared for it, they're not going to do it. If you are not a stable, a mentally stable person, they're not going to do it. But the psychologist also has to speak with a caregiver yeah. to make sure that they're strong enough as well. Mm-hmm. So, and that became something that we understood very clearly is how strong is your circle for support? And, and when you think it's super strong, rethink it, revisit it, because there are people that uh, was part of our circle of, of, of friends that, and, and even family that, you know, we, we were like, oh, these are the best people ever. We are surrounded with the best people. And when it came down to it, these people are like, we're out. And, and you're, what? You know, uh, we, had, we had a friend that literally was telling other people, oh, well, they're only raising fundraising for, for his transplant so that they can continue living their lavish, lavish lifestyle. I went, excuse me? So we had to fundraise for the transplant because there's a lot of things that insurance doesn't cover during transplant. You have to understand the way that Stanford worked at that time. I believe that they've changed some stuff, not, not everything, but they've changed some things was that they told us that we were going to have to live in a hotel within 20 minutes of the hospital after I got released from the hospital for three months. Mm-hmm. Insurance doesn't pay that. That comes out of our pocket. So not only are we paying for a hotel, we're paying, we're paying for food, right? Whether it's, which at the time we didn't know that we couldn't eat out, but we had to plan for it, right? So food, hotel, gas, what else? Uh, parking, like all that stuff, insurance doesn't pay for. Plus we were paying our rent for our house back in Sacramento and food back in Sacramento for our kids that were still living at, at home. So you know, it, and it's my job. and she had to leave her job. She actually got let go of her job because of me and my heart and my transplant. <laughs> I see your eyes are nice and wide. Yeah, they they literally yeah. fired her because she would not report to work when the doctor said, "Here you go, he's all yours." And and, and the job knew there was just no compassion, no, no compassion, no. Jen. That uh, wow, yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, we, we fundraised, uh, I fundraised the entire year that I waited for my transplant. I was doing, that was basically my full-time job was trying to fundraise for, for my transplant. And to even save your now, own life. Right. Right. Just so that way we had, we had money for transplant reasons, you know? And so we were using a, a, uh, a thing, National Foundation for Transplants that gave us a 501c um, tax write-off thing, uh, that people could, could, you know, deposit money into, um, so they would get a tax write-off and then, but the funds were specified only for transplant use, which means we would have to pay for it up front and then present them with a receipt and then they could reimburse us. So it was great. And, and, and yet we have, you know, what we thought were super close friends that were saying, well, they're only fundraising so that they can continue living their lavish lifestyle. I'm like, what lavish life? First of all, we couldn't because we couldn't touch that money unless it was related to the transplant. So what do you mean? Our lavish lifestyle, fundraising for our lavish. What? Yeah, we're fundraising so that I can continue to eat healthy the way that I'm supposed to eat after transplant. I don't know. It's, it's really weird. Like there's there's so many changes um, that happen in your life. You You truly discover who you're your close, close friends are. We had a, a yeah, in fact, I'm a gal. nothing. Cause I'm like, yep. <laughs> yeah. It, it's yeah, really amazing too. how, like when, when the rubber really has to hit the road, it's, it's, it's kind of, well, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Because like I said, you, falls you, away. yeah. And you, you think that you can rely on people and you're, you're just, you're like, really? You can't, you're amazed. When these people let you down and, and they're the last people in the world that you would think would let you down, you know, but it happens. And so that's why I say, when you think you've got a good solid support team and you may, you may have this, the best solid support team ever, and they may stick with you the entire time. Again, this was my story. You know, this is what happened to me, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure 
and this is going off of my experience and hearing other transplant recipients um, experience too, I'm pretty sure that that solid support team, there's going to be someone in there that you think is going to be solid and they're not going to be. And it may really surprise you who that person winds up being. So just, just expect that. <laughs> expect that. Mm -hmm. So a year passes. We go to my one year anniversary, uh, one year birthday. Uh, when you have a heart transplant, you have a, a new birthday. So I actually have two birthdays now, January 28th and March 4th. So it's kind of fun. I really mess with people with that one, especially like when they're like, oh, okay, when's your birthday? 3476 or 12819. And they're just like, what? <sighs> yeah, I have two birthdays. So we get to the one year. Hey, Jason, you're doing so great. We're so excited for you. You no longer have to wear the mask as much, right? Again, still the Whitney conditions, uh, the construction, those are the examples. Also, like if, I, if I'm on a plane, you know, tight confined spaces, yeah, mask up. So they said, hey, you don't have to wear the mask. Great. Can I go back to work? Absolutely. Okay. Can I get my commercial license back? Because I was a, a commercial license driver to drive our bigger bus limos and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So start back at work. Uh, start back to driving limousines again. And about three weeks later, COVID hits the country. 2020. Now, what I was doing for life to, to, you know, keep myself healthy and alive by wearing the mask. Now everybody's doing it. So now I don't look like such a freak anymore, which is great, right? I'm not walking into a bank wearing a mask anymore, feeling weird, you know, hey, give me all your money. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> so everyone's like, oh yeah, you're a trendsetter. Yeah, great. Like that's the trend I wanted to set, right? It's wearing a mask. <laughs> so yeah, that was, uh, that was surprising. Um, COVID affected my job very badly. Obviously the, uh, the whole entertainment industry pretty much went away. Wine tasting went away for the most part. My company actually shut down. And so I actually told my boss, I said, look, I'm still on disability. Go ahead and give the work to the guys that need it. I'll back off and let them, you know, let them work. I, I've got an income basically. And then of course it was, I don't, I didn't even think it was like a month after that and they had to close the, the doors all together. So while we were at home uh, or while I was at home, Jen, Jen went back to work. I was doing a lot of fixing projects and it finally got to the point where it's like, Jen says, Hey, uh, we're running out of money and you know, you need to go to work. Why don't you get paid to fix things? Okay. So. I applied for a position as a maintenance tech for a 97 unit, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, 76 unit apartment complex. Got the job, loved it, did great with it. And now uh, the company that we worked for uh, offered Jen and I worked for the same company. And so they offered her a raise and a promotion to move out here to Virginia. And so we came out here, we tested the waters for a couple of weeks and said, okay, yeah, let's do it. And we moved out here. And we've been working pretty much nonstop for the last seven months. So it's, it's been wild. It's been a wild ride, but I'm, I'm healthy. I am doing amazing with the exception that, like I said, I've, I've gotten off that plant slant diet and I desperately, I'm working to change that, working to get back on that diet, not just for the health of my organs and my heart, but for my overall body health. When you have a transplant, they give you your dry weight which is the weight that you should be at given your height, given your, you know, your conditions, everything. Well, my dry weight is 180. Actually, I think it's like 176 pounds, but there's no way I can get down to that. And, and the doctors know that. So they want me to stay right around 180, 182, which I've been able to do all the way up until I moved out here. And then like, again, got off the diet, started like, just even though I'm getting a ton of exercise at work, it's the dieting. So I'm now up to like 200 pounds and I'm going, uh, uh, this ain't working for me. I'm again, having problems with difficulty in breathing, but I know that it's all related to my weight that I put on. Mm -hmm. So after transplant, it's vitally important. And I, I think, I think maybe deep down for me, I'm doing this again as a test, because like I said earlier, when you have congenital heart disease, you push the envelope. You've got to know where your limits are. And I think I'm kind of, I'm, I know my limit is at my weight and it's where I'm at right now. So 
I've got to get back down to that 180, 182 range. And I'll be doing amazing because I've got tons of energy now, lots and lots of energy. I'm physically able to do things that I was not able to do before. In fact, I have a, a video on my uh, Facebook that shows me, you know, chopping wood and, you know, the, like that stuff I never would have done prior to transplant. I've gone out and I've actually ran a 5K, something I've never done before transplant. Wow. So, yeah. So, and, and I have a lot <laughs> more goals, but I, I've got to get back to, you know, that, that weight that I should be at. Um, again, right now, just, just the exercise I'm getting at work and I'm like, okay, I'm huffing and, and I'm puffing, but I know it's because I put on this weight that I shouldn't have. So weight creates problems that you don't realize whether you're healthy or not. It just creates a lot of problems. So there you go. There's my one get out of this whole program is uh, stay a good, healthy weight, eat good and uh, get plenty of exercise. <laughs> if your doctors say that all the time, you see it on TV all the time. Oh, it's so important. I, I can't even begin to tell you how true that is. And even when I was doing when I that first year after transplant that I was on my plant slant diet and the second year, I mean, I was in my prime condition. I felt so amazing, was sleeping solid at night. Just, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I've just never experienced that before in life to where now it's like so, so much more vivid. It's like a blind person that can see all of a sudden where it's, oh, wow, everything is all brand new. But it was like life is, is so brand new to me. And, and yet there's days that I go, I, I can't believe where I was. You know, I look back and I go, wow, I lived 40 years on one chamber of my heart, not four, one. Like, who does that? That's almost incredible. But I did it. You did. <clears throat> and I did it with a smile, mm -hmm. right? Like, again, I could have easily sat on my pity pot or, you know, just, oh, poor me, poor me, and did nothing with my life. And I, I, I could have, but I didn't. I had a lot of challenges in my life between the death of my brother, the death of my mother. We all deal with death in our life in some way, shape or form. I, I even failed to mention that like six months after my mother passed, my dog had, had died and I had him since he was 16 when I had to put him down. I had him when he was two. So, you know, he was there a long time in my life. Like I've gone through a lot of, of craziness in my life that most people I don't, I don't know that they could handle that. I don't know that they would want to. Well, nobody wants to, I guess. But I don't know. I don't have regrets. Not by any means. It's God gave me this, this gift. And I, I call it a gift. Some people look at it and they go, oh my God, you got cursed. You didn't get a gift. No, I got a gift. And I say it's a gift because I, I've learned to face challenges that most people will never have to face will never want to face. And I faced him and, and I ran with it. Not to say that I'm cocky or arrogant about it because I don't think about it. it it's not until I do something like this where I'm actually reflecting on it that I go, wow. <laughs> you know, I really, uh, wow. I always remember, I have no tattoos on me, but I always, always was like, hey, if I ever get a tattoo, I want to get a tattoo of my heart, like my original heart, until I saw the picture of it. And I saw the picture of it. Uh, Jen actually showed it to me when I was still in, in the hospital after my transplant. She goes, she goes, are you ready? To she waited. She was so great about it. She waited until I was like really coherent. Like all the, the pain meds had, had worn off. Like I can make choices. Like, yeah, I was balancing out. She showed it to me. Mm -hmm. I went, oh my God, it looks like a piece of meat I'd throw on the grill. Like it really does. Wow. I, I look at it even now and I'm like, there is no way that's heart. It does not look anything like what if you were to look up online, you know, anatomical heart, it looks nothing like that. It was not that. Wow. Yeah. And and I'm like, well, there goes that tattoo idea. <laughs> Cause I did. I always wanted to have that tattoo on the lawn. And until I saw the picture, I'm like, nope, nope. Cause someone look at that. Oh, who the hell screwed up on that tattoo? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So it was, it was unique. I've been through a lot. It's, it's been a wild ride. Well, thank you so much for sharing. If you can believe it, we've been talking for two hours, two hours and 10 minutes. Yeah, I know. 
and, and I mean, here. and there's so many more questions. I mean, we might have to circle back again because, in fact, I, I think we should do that, you know, for a future episode. Yeah, um, I'd love to. I'd love yeah. to. I can go on and on and on. I mean, this is not the version I was going to give you. The The version I was going to give you is is so much more bridged, but you really wanted me to go into detail about a lot of things that I traditionally just kind of glance over, you know? And I think it's important, though. I think those details are really vitally important. Well, like I said, I'm building like a spoken encyclopedia for people. Um, yeah, I think it's great. So, yeah, listeners, well, Jason and Jen and I will make a future appointment. And I will put in the show notes how to to find them. They mentor fellow transplant patients. And then, of course, you can always reach out to me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Boots, so much for yeah. having us on and, and uh, you know, for taking the time to, to chat with us. I love I love sharing my story. I love hearing about your story. Uh, and he it, shared that yesterday with me. So I was able to hear your story. You know, it's, it's incredible because I've always said I've been fortunate because I grew up with my heart condition. Right. Like it, it's it was never a surprise to me. On your hand, I can't imagine the shock, the, the mental effects that it had on you because you that's didn't true. you didn't grow it was like overnight bam hello i think that's mm -hmm. harder to deal with than someone like myself that's dealt with it all their life and and has learned how to adapt you know in in dealing with it yeah exactly so let's get into that next time yeah let's 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 <laughs> And that's our episode for today. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of your day with me. If you enjoyed this podcast, I sure would appreciate if you would go to my website, theheartchamberpodcast.com and make a donation. Also, if you are a fellow heart warrior, I'd love to hear from you. Would you like to share your story on this podcast? You can either send me an email at boots at theheartchamberpodcast.com or you can go to my website and go to the contact link and leave me a message there. There's also a way to leave me a voicemail on my website. I'm so glad you joined me for today. Please be sure to come back next Tuesday to the Heart Chamber Podcast for another inspiring episode.